In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So can y'all hear me better? Oh, if y'all respond to that question, that answers the question. <laughs> That's what somebody at 8 o'clock said. They said that I can hear you better, but it's funny if it was last week and you asked me that question, I would have said, what did he just say? So hopefully we're trying a couple different things. Big, big thanks to Dan and Matt Ray, who's not with us today, for their thankless work over there trying to figure this out until we're able to sort through our power surge issue. So we're I'm incredibly thankful and encourage you uh, when you see them around to, to thank them and to love on them because that is a thankless job, sound in a church. Who can hear me now? Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Prodigals. Oh, oh, another news. And other news. The bishop got back to me late last week out of the blue, and I will be installed as your rector on April 20th. Hey, that's cool. That's like a year early, so it's really cool. If the bishop's watching, I'm just kidding. It's right on time. No, it's good to be with you. So, the prodigal son. How many of you have heard this story before? All right, a lot of us have heard some version of this story. It's kind of one that's full of good advice for us. But I love the story of the prodigal son because it reminds us of us. Right, it's who we are. We're so many aspects of this story in terms of the younger son, the older son. We can relate. If I told you you're going to win a billion dollars right now, that St. Francis in the field is going to write a check for a billion dollars and hand it to you, many of you would probably spend a good chunk of it, if not a lot of it, on yourself. You don't have to say yes to that. And just because you're in church doesn't mean you automatically say, no, I would give a bazillion of it to the Red Cross. And, of course, I would give back to the church a whopping billion. No, it's just human nature. And some of us would support our families. But the first thing that's going to come to mind is what I can do with that for myself. It's just nature. It doesn't make us bad people. It's just temptation. It's just who we are. And just for the record, if there ever comes a day where this church can write you a billion dollar check, <laughs> I'm here every day. No, I'm just kidding. I will stop working one day a week. No. That'd be an exciting day. The younger son takes his inheritance. He goes to a distant land. He lives dissolutely. Now, when we hear that, we probably in our minds think of all sorts of bad things. Obviously, later in the story, the older brother points out a particular activity that is negative. But the dissolute living, and that's what I love about this parable, what the Greeks doing there, what, what's happening in Luke's gospel is taking your stuff and living away from God. That's the dissolute, that's the translation for dissolute living, is turning away from God squandering the gift of the kingdom. So this younger brother goes and squanders the gift of the kingdom, runs out of money, and then when he's out of everything, hardship hits, and he's like, oh snap, what am I going to do now? And to make it even worse for himself, he's with the pigs. This is the most unclean of the unclean animals, to be rolling around in the mud of the pigs, to eat the pods of a pig. Can you imagine? what? How many of you raised pigs before? None of you raised a Jimmy Dean or a Mia Hamm? Jimmy Dean, Mia Hamm? Did you, have, did you name Jimmy Dean and Mia Hamm? No, that's just cruel, isn't it? That's just cruel. On Hillshire Farm, you had Jimmy Dean and Mia. No. But pigs, I fed some pigs before. My uncle had pigs up in middle Georgia. Them's nasty. And what they eat is, na they eat anything. They eat your toe if you give it to them. They're crazy. Even in Israel to this day, they have pigs, but they're, they're kept on platforms. They cannot walk on the land of Israel. So they raise pigs elevated. That's how unclean these animals are. 
So here he is with the unclean of the unclean. And he has this epiphany. I've got to go back to dad. I've used everything up, and I've got to go back to dad. Here's the first connection to us. How many times are we off doing something for ourselves, even if we think we're doing it for others? We're off living, really looking out for number one exclusively, hoarding, holding on to, assuming, living in fear, and we just blow it. And then when we blow it, something catastrophic happens, and what's the first thing we do? We run back to God. All of a sudden, our prayer life goes into overdrive. All of a sudden, we're sitting in church every Sunday. All of a sudden, we're hoping for some miracle, and we're waiting for it to happen. We immediately, like the younger son, repent, and we formulate what we're going to say to God. We start to barter with God. I will go to church every Sunday if you do blank. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. I'm not knocking that. That's just what we do. That's why I love this parable. We tend to get ourselves into the weeds once it's all hit the fan. Once it's all blown up, we tend to come back into that moment. And he does, and he formulates a statement, and this is where the story shifts. All of a sudden, we're in the story. Because it says, he says, Father, I have sinned against you and heaven. This is no longer about some son and his dad. This is no longer just about some boys growing up in Palestine in the early days. This is now about us. So he comes home in his filthy clothes. And what happens? God moves down the road. He doesn't have to come all the way back to the gates of the kingdom. The God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac go down the road and meets him and embraces him in his filth, in his nastiness, and loves on him. And then he begins to lay out his prepared speech, Father, I have sinned, and the father doesn't even care. He says, get the robe, get the fatted calf, let's have a big party. I'm sure the younger son, we don't get this in the text, has to be going, Wait, what? Because, right, we, when we mess up, we tend to think we are not worthy of love, that we are not worthy of God. How many denominations of Christianity have so much guilt that they don't even know what to do with it? How many denominations, how many Christians walk this earth feeling like they're not worthy to stand before the God who runs down the road to them even in their worst who embraces them, who embraces the mothers, Teresas of the world, and who embraces the Hitlers of the world. That's the God you and I worship. The God who loves us equally. I don't care about mortal sin and venial sin and nada, 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 because it ain't in the text. This is a God who meets you in your muck, who meets you in your sin, who meets you when you mess up and gives you a big old hug. And he doesn't make you come all the way back. How ridiculous is that? How crazy is that? Could you imagine the Queen of England saying, running out of Buckingham Palace to meet somebody down the road? Can you imagine that? It's ridiculous. But that's God. It's not what we expect. We build boxes that we put God in, and we decide what God can do. You know what that's called? Heresy. When we reduce God down to something that makes sense to us. And this parable blows it all up. Come back, they have the party. What's the older brother do? Complains. Isn't that what we siblings do, though? I was so perfect, and look at him. He was bad, and he's stinky. That's what we always do. Like, this has been the theme these last several Sundays. Remember last week we talked about how we always look at everybody else's field? You know, we're looking at their field going, they need to water. You think of an HOA. Like, the head of the HOA looks at your house and says, you need to trim your hedges. And you're looking at their house going, and it's like overrun. And you're like, really? Like, trim my bushes? Have you seen your yard? It's that concept. We always do that. We always do that. We always want to pretend 
to ourselves that somehow we're more righteous than somebody else, that somehow they are wrong and we use derogatory terms, we call them bad names because we assume certain people are in and certain people are out. And for the older brother, the younger brother was out. It reminds you of the, the Pharisee. Remember a couple stories back, the Pharisee who was standing in the temple and he was like, thank God I'm not like that tax collector over there who's beating his breast saying, have mercy on me, Lord. He's not looking at the Pharisee going, thank God I'm not like that guy. Like we all do that. We all are the older brother. We all want to pretend like we know who is capable of receiving God's grace and forgiveness. We assume we know who's in and who's out. You know that old joke that uh, St. Peter took some folks up to heaven to take a tour? And they walked past a couple doors, and he said, we got to be quiet by these doors. And that room was the Baptists, and that room was the Catholics. And then there was everybody else having a big party. Y'all heard this joke before? No? Well, now you have. But reality, you could plug in not just picking on the Baptists and the Catholics, because my in-laws are here, and they're Catholic, and I'm not picking on them. But we're all like that. We all have in our minds a certain group of people that can't be in heaven. They just can't. They're so bad, they're so evil, they can't. They could never run back. God would never run down the road to embrace them. You know what the problem with that is? You've been that person. You've been that person. The minute you draw that line, you put yourself into that same boat because it's human nature that we fall short of the glory of God, that we have to strive to seek God out. We have to strive to live the good news. You don't just get to decide who's in and out. You can't just follow a rule book and all of a sudden magically get there because you're going to fall short. So we, the thing I love about this story is we're all in the boat. We're all at different points. The younger son, when we live away from God and we repent, we come back and we're received by God. And at other times, we might be humming along just right and then we just fall into the trap of going, "Mm, mm, 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 mm." no. And we sit there and we judge and we draw lines and we get so passionate about it and we break relationships. Just think for a moment what this world would look like if everybody who sat in a church pew in this country right now, everybody who's sitting in church right now across the country were to take to heart one thing, that we are called to build bridges of community. What would that look like if all of us left church today, found a bunch of people we disagree with, stopped the judging, and just built community? What do you think might happen in this country? What do you think might happen in the world if we believe we had that power, if we lived for the gospel? This is what this parable reminds us of. We have to choose God. God is choosing us continually. God will move down the road and embrace us all the time. But we have to choose God. We have to choose to follow God. We have to choose to be kingdom builders. We have to choose to cultivate the gospel. We have to choose to repent when we fall short. We have to choose to forgive those around us. We have to choose not to be selfish, not to live in fear, not to live in scarcity, to remember that we have enough to take all that we are and all that we have for the betterment of the kingdom. This is what we have to do. This is simply what we're called to do. So my brothers and sisters here at St. Francis, I want you to help me as we journey to Easter to be the people of God, to repent as a community and to draw near to God. And as we say every Sunday, to go in peace, to love and serve the Lord. Amen.